Hello. This is my brief overview of Chapter 7 of Frederick Wilhelmsen's book, Man's Knowledge of Reality. This chapter is short, just seven pages long, and is titled, The Logic of Existence. We begin by considering the question of why the truths of the first six chapters are ignored or denied by so many thinkers. Part of the answer is the mind-body separation, but there is another deeper root found in our attitude toward reality. Being is everywhere around us, but when we try to explain it, we lose it. This suggests an error in our thinking and speaking about our experience of being. Classical logic, Wilhelmsen says, treats the subject and predicate of a judgment as though they were concepts. His analysis of this situation leads to two erroneous systems, rationalism and phenomenology. The rationalist places existence in his philosophical system as a concept, but then he tries to accomplish the impossible task of deducing existence from a grasp of essences. Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz try this and fail. The phenomenologist, like Husserl, brackets existence, sets it aside, and focuses his philosophy on other issues. Both of these systems follow from the assumption that whatever cannot be conceptualized cannot be understood. Wilhelmsen announces his goals for this chapter at the end of the first section. He will show two things. First, that existence is contained in neither the subject nor the predicate of a judgment. And second, that existence is represented in a judgment by the verb to be. If the subject signified existence, it would have to do so in one of three ways, none of which is possible. The subject might signify existence in general, but this is an abstraction of the mind. Real existence is always particular. The subject might signify a thing plus its existence, but in this case, Existence adds nothing to the thing mentioned. The existence of John merely refers to John, who exists. I can just as easily talk about the existence of unicorns, which refers to something that does not carry a prior judgment of existence. Lastly, the subject might signify a thing precisely in its very existing, but if this were true, then it would be superfluous to say that a thing exists. Merely naming the subject would be sufficient. But this is not how language works. Naming a subject does not convey its real existence. This understanding would also make negative judgments and identity judgments impossible or superfluous. So, actual existence is not signified by the subject of a judgment. What about the predicate? If the predicate signified existence, it would have to do so in one of two ways, both of which lead to dead ends. The predicate could signify an existing attribute as existing, but then it would be impossible to use a predicate that denies existence to something. Wilhelmsen's zombie example is instructive here. The predicate could signify the existence of the subject, but in this case the predicate would be superfluous in existential judgments. John is existing adds nothing to John is. We now face a problem. All judgments contain a judgment of existence, but this judgment of existence is found neither in the subject nor in the predicate of the judgment. Where is it then? It is in the copula, the verb to be. This verb acts as the coupling link between the subject and predicate, but it can perform this function only because it has the more primordial function of signifying existence. Judgment is an existential knowing, a knowing of actually existing beings, beings in act. Wilhelmsen concludes, Existence, therefore, while escaping conceptualization, does not escape knowledge, because knowledge is always of being, of that which is in some order. That's the end of my summary of this chapter. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye.